I remember how it challenged me, even in the, in the YWAM days in, in 74, I would often be, because we'd read through the scriptures systematically, and I'd often be so challenged with what it was that motivated the cross. Why would God go to such extreme to, I mean, we, we touched on it yesterday, you know, why would uh, an agricultural field fetch such a high price if the person who buys the field already knows the treasure? He could just negotiate a cheaper deal, a bargain discounted price, and here God comes and he pays the ultimate price for a broken, uh, messed up world, a messed up humanity, he pays the ultimate price. And I began to understand that there had to be a very real link between Genesis 1.26 and the cross. If what God redeemed would not be justified in his image and his likeness, revealed again in human form. And isn't that exactly what Jesus came to vindicate? The fact that God did not make a mistake when he made your body to be his temple. And so I think that becomes such a, a reference in one's understanding of the cross. Because so, for so long the enemy tried to reduce our understanding of the cross to sentimental value. We'd shed a tear, you know, at Easter, and we'd see Mel Gibson's movie for the th umptieth time and, and really feel so moved emotionally, which is great. But there's a revelation that became the thrust of Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry was, was engaged in one reality. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ constrains me. Now, he knew what it was to be zeal-driven. He had a passion for religion. I mean, he was the front-runner. He exceeded more than any of his own age group. But he discovered a revelation of the mystery of the gospel. And later on when he relates to that in, in Galatians 1, he says this gospel that I preach is not man's gospel. Even in his days there were many messages branded gospel. But he understood that what distinct, dis, distinguished his understanding of the gospel was not something that he learned from Gamaliel. They're not something that he borrowed information from, from the di disciples. He says, God revealed his son in me. Many translations have it that way. Some say to me, but the Greek says in me. And in that revelation, he discovered the revelation of Christ. No longer reduced to a portion of history or a wonderful future expectation, but the revelation of Christ in me. And I think that is so key to, to our point of departure in discovering the reality of Christ. You know, I often mention the fact that Paul's um, mission statement would be recorded in Ephesians 3 and verse 9. He says, I want to make all men see. So if Paul is driven by the love of Christ, his whole ambition is to make all men see. Paul sees it possible to persuade the human race. Even in the light and the context of many refusing to listen to him, many turning their backs on him. Later on in prison, he sits there, he feels all embarrassed. I've lost my ministry in, in a sense. You know, here I am trapped in a cell, chained to this Roman soldier. And he writes to Timothy, he says, you know, do not be embarrassed about me or my chains. You know, and, 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 and in that context, Paul never compromised what he saw. And what he saw represented an understanding, uh, uh, back to now Ephesians uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 14, he says the love of Christ constrains me, because I'm convinced. So he makes this simple calculation that, that inspires and ignites the love of God in him. He says one has died for all. I was preaching in, in Swakopmund just a few weeks ago, and in that evening there was a little two-year-old, maybe two-and-a-half-year-old girl sitting with her back towards me on the floor, playing, minding her own business, and I'm preaching, and I say, man, it's like one plus one, and she shouts, two. <laughs> Everybody just picked up. I mean, here's this girl sitting with her back to the preacher. You know, two years old, don't preach two years Two. <laughs> so we call the message one plus one equals two. <laughs> the fact is, that is the simplicity of the gospel. And you know, it doesn't become two when we get a few people to understand it. It was under two before anyone understood it. You know, it, it, it's just the, 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 that simple, the mathematical equation, the, the economy of God saw Christ Jesus as representative of the human race. So Paul says, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that if one died for all, equals, all have died. And in that context, he says, we no longer consider any man from a human point of view, even though we once knew him from a human point of view. So it's, it's really the, the, the point of departure in our, in our understanding of the gospel is that we are no longer dealing 
with any scripture in this book that does not immediately find its relevance in Christ. He is the key that unlocks scripture. Say that again. This is the most dangerous book in the whole world. No other book has ever divided and confused more people than the Bible did. But there's only one code. The scripture finds its relevance in the revelation of Christ. In the Afrikaans, I won't go, to, go there, but in, uh, I'll just touch on it in Luke 24 and verse 27. When Jesus begins to introduce himself in scripture and not in the flesh to two people who knew him in the flesh. They witnessed the cross, but they did not recognize him. Yeah. They were blindfolded because they, they knew him after the flesh. Yeah. And Jesus could have tapped him on the shoulder and said, hi guys. I know it's a, getting a little bit dark and you're a bit confused and you're so trapped in your own mindsets because they were debating the fact that they felt so disappointed there was no political agenda as they hoped would be, you know, in this mighty moment of, of Passover. And yet Jesus went and died on them. And Jesus begins by expounding to them all the scriptures from Moses right through that was relevant to him. But the home van to pass was, said the Afrikaans. And it's the only possible way we can study scripture, is to understand that this book unlocks the mystery that God spoke in a shadow in the first half and spoke in a mirror manifestation in the person of Christ. So for me to continue to, script, to, to study scripture in any other light is most boring and most confusing. And it can be entertaining. I mean, one can really get some entertaining <laughs> stuff and information. A guy was speaking the other day about you know some man who's talking about the, he's a, uh, what do they call him, a sabbatarier. And he says he's like, he's got a whole series of this guy's videos. He's like prison break. You want to listen to the one and the next. And so the enemy loves to bring a counterfeit thing that can be very entertaining, but it's not life-giving. You know, I believe that any teaching that you ever encounter can only be judged by this one reality. How does this teaching fulfill the whole law? And what is the fulfillment of the whole law? To passionately love your maker with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And then Jesus says equal to this, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if what we busy ourselves with in scripture does not ignite a passionate, intimate encounter with your maker 24-7, then you might as well hear this gospel because this gospel does, guaranteed, guaranteed. You know, Paul says, I commend myself with the open statement of the truth to every man's conscience. He says, I'm not here trying to brag about my time. So some, sometimes people ask me, how much time do you spend with the Lord? You know? <laughs> what a silly question. You know, when someone asks me, what's your definition of full-time ministry? I said, it's just simple. It's just enjoying God full-time. Enjoying Him. The moment ministry becomes less than enjoying God full-time. Ministry goes back under the law. Motivation, a zeal for God, ambition for Jesus, and we've got to go and do through, th through these routines and try and really establish ourselves within the context of ministry. But Paul explains his ministry not as a career choice, but as love and passion driven, simply because he's discovered the truth that every single human life on this planet stands equally represented in Christ. I know no longer any man after a label. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, because we died. He died our death. You see, we, we've exhausted and got mileage for centuries out of the fact that Jesus died for us. And the devil didn't have too much of a problem with that. Most of our creeds, you know, celebrating that on the th third day was raised, the devil goes thumbs up. He understands he was raised of the three days. But what didn't he understand? What was the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations? That we were included. He didn't understand that. If he did, he would never have crucified the Lord of glory. That was the big mistake. Now he cannot reverse the cross, but he tries to blindfold us. With what? With unbelief. And what is unbelief? Not seeing the mystery. Not realizing that as he is, so are we in this world. I'm not talking about the world yeah. to come. Here on planet earth, God has a purpose. And that is to display the knowledge of his glory so that all flesh can see it. Now all flesh is not going to see it in spooky form. Or in angelic form. I mean, a, a hundred meter tall angel can appear to you and preach a different gospel. Cannot match the simplicity of this gospel declared from man to man. Because there's an impartation in human conscience. The word conscience, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 verse 2. He says with the open, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. 
He says, with the open statement of the truth, this is the Revised Standard Version I'm quoting, with the open statement of the truth, you, would you agree with me that the open statement means that there's no hidden clause? Yeah. It's not like buying this cheap cell phone because the price is that large but the fine print is that small and you end up paying more. <laughs> yeah. Preaching grace, brother, but add my little law. Just give Moses a space. The veil remains. Paul says, with the open statement of the truth. And remember that, that's 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. And Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. So just a few sentences before. The breath was like still hanging there. When Paul says, now with unveiled faces, we all are gazing, beholding the glory of the Lord. Not a replica Rolex bought in China. The authentic glory of God, which was the image, the likeness of invisible God made visible in human form. We all relate to it now. How? As in a mirror. If it was display window stuff, it's religion. Then we've got to try and strive and become like, you know. But Jesus didn't come as an example for us, but of us. Whatever happened to us at, in, in Adam was cancelled through one act of righteousness. One gift. We cannot underestimate this great salvation. So here we are beholding, gazing into the mirror of the word. And what happens to us? What religion could never succeed to do. We are changed. Not through a lifelong process of eventually getting there where I finally qualify that God can slide me into his heaven. But changed. from It's a paradigm shift from the old ugly duckling mindset. To knowing the truth of this one. Not a truth that's going to take years and years of facelifts and how to fake this one life courses, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> the truth that sets you free to be free indeed. So what would free indeed imply if it was not? God's space redeemed to reveal himself, to live his life, to encounter his life through you. So we all with unveiled faces beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Remember in chapter 3 he speaks of two glories, the glory of the flesh. Mm. And so Moses had to hang the little veil just to right. not disappoint the people because the stuff's fading. It's got to sell by date. So I've got to go and wait on the Lord again and really increase the anointing and then, then I can go again, you know, and quickly come while the glory is there. But it's going to fade away just now, you know, when we go to the pub and we have a pint, then the glory is gone again. And we've got to just go and pray again and just wind up this thing again and get into the anointing and we go again. That's Moses. And then he says, but um, there's another glory that's unfading. Isaiah 40 speaks of the voice that cries in the wilderness. And what does it cry? It says, all flesh is grass. And it's glory. It's seasonal. It's a beautiful flower, but it fades. I say, but they that cover with God shall renew their strength. The young men, I mean, flesh in the prime of its life. This athlete who holds the national record, the title, the famous one. His strength fails him. He faints. Becomes exhausted. Can only jump the die. Can only run that fast. And then Isaiah 40 concludes with, but they, that kavah. Unfortunately, we've translated it, wait. So we've become very diligent waiters upon the Lord. You know, and we've been waiting a long time. But if you're waiting, it's not about how sincere you are. It's about how, how are you waiting. Because you can wait very sincere, very long, and not renew your strength, and not mount up with wings of an eagle. I remember when I was in Blantyre once, we were taxing, please interrupt me if I talk too much. <laughs> um, I just want to conclude this one thought. I think, I think what's important is that we ask questions. We must yeah. talk now. But okay, I will not go your gedachte klaar maak, want ek is nog... Blantyre. Ek, ek so Blantyre, here we are on this runway, and the previous time we were in Blantyre, it was not in an aircraft. And it took us forever to cover very short distances. So we're taxiing, not taxiing, you know, like on an airport, not like in, in Soweto or elsewhere <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> and 
it suddenly struck me, but wow, check this runway. You know, I mean, it's smooth, it's straight. Every high place was brought low, every valley filled up, every crooked place straightened out, it was smooth. And the, I'm strapped in this vehicle designed for liftoff. It's going to get airborne. Gravity is not going to hold it down in the tarmac. Eh? And I just suddenly realized Isaiah 40 begins with a runway. And it concludes with mounting up with wings like an eagle. And I realized, you know, we could come with uh, Moritz's Ferrari onto the tarmac <laughs> and even beat the Boeing running up and down that runway. But that vehicle is not going to get airborne. Yeah. It's going to burn a lot of fuel and destroy its tires and brakes, and, but it's not going to get airborne. Wrong vehicle. Yeah. What am I saying? The key word in Isaiah 40 to get airborne is the word in the Hebrew language, kava. We've translated kava to mean wait or trust in the Lord. Kava means to intertwine. You see, there's a place of intertwining that takes place when you discover the mirror. Suddenly I realize, but I'm not studying history. I'm studying my story. If the whole Bible is about Jesus, then the whole of Jesus is about you. Because his name means your salvation. In capital letters. The highest authority in the heavens declare that God succeeded to redeem the human race. From what? From an inferior expression. From the expression of the glory of the flesh. Because here we've been trapped for ages and generations in just trying to do some maintenance, you know. And, and, and our whole concern has been the cosmetic value of this clay pot. But there's a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is... Like a treasure hidden in the field. And the Greek word is agri-field, agricultural field. So there's more to this agricultural field than the wine I can harvest from it. The cattle I can raise on it. The wheat I can harvest from it. There is a treasure hidden in the field. And Jesus came in the human body to unveil the original treasure, which was what? The glory of God in human form, not in angelic form, in human form, so that we may now with unveiled faces behold and reference the glory of the Lord, but no longer in shadow form, no longer in prophetic form as in a mirror. Now, are you implying in, in that story about the agricultural field that words like that yeah. uh, effort into it? I'm saying that there are two harvests that we are laboring for. The one in, 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 in um, John 4 speaks about where Jesus says, when they're walking through the wheat fields, he says, you say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. What is that? What does that harvest represent? My ability to sustain my life on planet Earth. Problem is, I'm not designed to live by bread alone. So my best harvest is going to disappoint me. I can have a harvest greater than what uh, my great-grandfather had, you know, 50 years ago. But that harvest is still going to disappoint me because it's just soul realm. But Jesus says, I want you to see a different, different harvest. And it's within your sight. It's within your horizon. But you just got to lift up your eyes. You see, while we look not at the things that are seen because we become so snared by the harvest of the flesh, the glory of the flesh. He says, I want you to see. And when I see that now, suddenly the veil is removed. Moses is out of the picture. Jesus is the picture. You see, Moses was the picture of the state of Adam. Jesus is the picture of the image and likeness of God in human form. So we can no longer preach man in Adam we, or preach man in Moses. We preach man in Christ. What I wanted to say right at the offset was our association is not something that we can trace in our little history. We can trace it according to Ephesians 1 verse 4 to before the foundation of the earth. God associated us in Christ. Which meant it was impossible for God to consider one individual thought concerning His Son that excludes you. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Of God are you in Christ. Say that again. 1 Corinthians 1.30. It says, Of God, of God's doing are you in Christ. In the Knox translation it says it so beautifully. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. You know, that's why I so enjoy the original text, because the original text holds such a wealth in one word, in one little preposition, 
Now the preposition ek, which is the first part of the word ekklesia. Hear yeah. how that is, that is the, 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 the word out of God. Out of God. Um, we are in Christ. Of God's doing. Knox translates it. It is from him that you take your origin. Through Christ Jesus. So he writes a whole sentence that we take our origin out of him. You see, that is the appeal of the gospel. Now Paul can say, this is what I wanted to come to in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, where the open statement of the truth, you see, Paul's not trying to sneak in a new theory. He's not trying to compete with current philosophy. Here he is with a, with a Greek philosopher. He's not trying to add a little a Christian point of view, you know, so that we can at least build an altar for Jesus as well. Or rename the unknown God one to the Jesus one. Now Paul says, you know, while some say I'm of Petros or Kephas and Apollos, and even while I'm the part of the Messianic group, I'm equally deceived. Because what did Jesus come to unveil? He came to unveil you. Paul says, with the open statement of the truth, we appeal to every man's conscience. How's that for an audience? That's exactly the audience God had in mind. When God spoke to this planet in one man, the language of God is Jesus Christ. In these last days, God has spoken to us. We are His audience. And what did God say? In Christ. The effulgence of His glory. I don't know whether I pronounce it correct, but the radiance of His glory. The accuracy of the character of God. The Greek word character. The very being of God on display in human form. And then He continues. And, and He has made purification for sins. So He's cancelled whatever could keep the human race in an inferior mindset about themselves. He's made purification for sins. And he sat down. So the authority of the throne room is established upon the success of the cross. When John saw the throne, what did he see? He said, behold, the lion of Judah. What did he see? A lamb that was slain. The central theme of the throne of God is about your salvation. How can we escape if we neglect, underestimate such a great salvation? So the display of God in Paul's message is with the open statement of the truth. What did Jesus say? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So there's nothing obscure. There's nothing hidden. You know, when Colossians 1.15 says that he is the image of the likeness the, of the invisible God. He might as well have said it's impossible for God to ever hide again. God can never, ever be invisible again. So in Paul's understanding, he says, we appeal to every man's conscience. The word conscience is the Greek word sun, eido. Sun means together. Eido means to see. It is the opposite to the word hades. Hades means not to see. So what will the ecclesia do? The ecclesia is the revelation of our original identity. Ek, ecclesia. Ecclesia comes from the word kaleo. It means to surname. Isn't it interesting in Matthew 16 when Jesus first uses the word? He comes to introduce the Son of Man as the Son of God. His question was, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I said is the other day. And someone said am. So I'm in England. I'm not going to say is. <laughs> <laughs> who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And there were various opinions. At least they discerned by then in his ministry that this is more than ordinary. You know, we can't just reduce the Son of Man in terms of Christ to merely the Son of Mary and uh, Joseph, as we thought. So at least yeah, there's some prophetic unction here. There's some profound um, life here. Almost like Nicodemus felt so attracted to go and see him. So he sneaked in one night to just go and ask him questions. And then Jesus wanted to get an answer to this question. So he said, and you, who do you say that I am? And by revelation, Simon, illiterate, fisherman, never went to school. Simon said, you are the Messiah. You are what the Jewish nation is all about. You are what the nations are all about in terms of Abraham. You are the, the desire of the nations. You are the fulfillment of every promise, the Messiah. The Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus could stop the conversation there and said, correct. And sat back and asked another question. But that was the setting that introduced the platform of his ministry. 
Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I say, you are rock. Deuteronomy 32, 18. Ascribe greatness. He starts off with ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. But we've forgotten the rock, says verse 18, that begot us. The God of our origin. Isaiah 51 suggests if you seek God and pursue righteousness. Isaiah 55, 51 verse 1. Here's the clue. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. The quarry from which you were dug. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. So here, Simon's surname is honored in terms of Jonah, his father. But Jesus says you will not discover who you are within the context of your natural birth. You come from above. You've seen in me the rock of your origin. There's only one father, and it's not Jonah. And upon this rock, Petra, Petros, Petra, on this rock. Remember later on, Paul speaks about Kephas? Same guy. Kephas is just the Aramaic for rock. I so enjoy that Paul did that, because sometimes we can get so used to the sound of a name, Pete, Peter, Pete, that we forget the meaning. And it was all about a revelation. What was the revelation? That the Son of Man is the Son of God. And he says, upon this revelation, that the Son of Man is the Son of God, I will build my ecclesia. What is that? Ek, the original, the source. Kaleo, to surname. To identify by name. What you're saying is, the revelation is the Son of Man is the Son of God. The Son of Man, meaning the s- Mankind. 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 Exactly. That's what Jesus came to do. Remember, he came to be... Shabalala for Bafana Bafana. Score a goal on behalf of the team. But this time the team was just... But <laughs> <coughs> no, no, we won't go there. We won't go there. Here we go. Mm-hmm. As the Son of God. Uh-huh. That's what... Exactly. Came to reintroduce us to ourselves again. If you look at Psalm 22, there is no more graphic psalm that reveals the cross. Remember when Jesus explains the scriptures further on in Luke 24? He begins with Moses. He goes through all of Moses, all the psalms, all the prophets, and he reveals himself in context. He gives context to the context to the psalms, to the prophets, to Moses. So it's, Really, one of the most boring things to do is to try and read Scripture in any other context. You'll get totally on your slop and fuck. But when you realize that it's Christ, and Christ mirrors me, then it's a new encounter. Um, what was I about to say? Just tell me about this point here. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm so glad you asked me that question. Maybe we can just read it. Uh, um, can, I, can I just give you, uh, uh, just hang in for two minutes. I've just remembered what I wanted to say in the previous context. I just want to conclude that, then we'll go straight to there. Um, when, when um, oh yes, I was speaking about Psalm 22, which is this, this graphic portrayal of the crucifixion. And notice how it concludes, verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall... Remember and turn to the Lord. Now it's impossible to remember something that you've never known. You see, there is a memory print in the being of man. So that when I hear the gospel, remember the story of the free eagle? 
in the voice of the free eagle, there was enough authority to cancel. Tell the story of the free eagle because they yeah. this, know it. this eagle was in a, in a Pretoria zoo for 10 years. And Lydia and I met the lady who was involved in this program of releasing this bird from the Pretoria zoo. She was part of con nature conservation. We were on honeymoon in the mountains of Mapumalanga, then near Graskop. And she, she began to tell us how this eagle was to be released from its cage. Now, we were in conservation ourselves for a few years, and we absolutely love nature. And we all know that you cannot design a comfortable, big enough cage for an eagle. Impossible. So the decision was taken, let's free this bird after 10 years. And so she tells us, just a week before our visit, it happened. They transported this eagle in a wooden crate from Pretoria Zoo to Burke's Luck, and they had him positioned there early in the morning in a wonderful place, wide open space. Opened the cage, but the eagle wouldn't fly. Total frustration. They knew that this bird would never need to return to that cage again. And yet this bird just sat. And then suddenly, hours later, it just looked up, and then they heard the call of another eagle. And in that moment, something was communicated, and this one remembered, and he took off in flight. About a year or two, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we were visiting a rehab, a, a, a nature rehab center just below the Berks, like that same area. <coughs> Molo or something like that, if you ever go in that area. Very interesting. They've got all kinds of animals and birds, all the raptors and everything in cages. So I asked our guide, I asked him, you know, how successful are you in this rehab program? He says, well, it only works for those who remember who they are. I said, yeah, you're preaching my message, bro. <laughs> he says, if that eagle remembers that he's an eagle, takes off in flight, no longer flying instructions. And that's really is the essence of this gospel. It, Paul says, we appeal to every man's conscience. There is, a, there is an imprint in the life of your design that echoes, that resonates when you hear truth. You don't need an instruction manual. I mean, we don't go to kissing school. There's something that awakens <laughs> inside of you. <laughs> My brother, can I go? Let's, let's quickly go back to 1 Corinthians 2. I'd, this, this theme is so awesome. One cannot exhaust it. I really, this is because it, it's so all-inclusive that eventually you start realizing, but my mind's rocking because I can from now on no longer know any person from a human point of view. Yeah. Can are we you, quickly... Are you going to 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. The question, just for the sake of the CD, was the question was um, 1 Corinthians 13, um, which verse was it on? Verse 12. Verse 12. What, 12 what tense? Um, that, that speaks about, uh, we see um, in a mirror, not completely understanding, not completely unveiled. When it comes to tenses, you'll find in a little booklet that I've got done, I said that the tenses in, in the context of faith can become very confusing. When Jesus speaks about, uh, with, the, with the Pharisees, when they challenge, challenge him about um, the fact that he, how dare he say that I and the Father are one. And then, um, and, 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 oh, no, even before that, in chapter 8, he's speaking about we are children of Abraham. You know, we've never been enslaved to anyone. He says, if you were children of Abraham, you would have recognized me. And they said, how can you and Abraham talk like you on terms? I mean, he's, and then Jesus makes a statement. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And we find God in the process of Abraham's revelation of faith. God calls things which are not as though they were. We see prophetically the cross of Jesus Christ written in past tense. Yeah. You know, he, he, he was wounded for our transgressions. It's like it already happened. You know, so it's very difficult sometimes for us, but in the context of our tenses, especially Afrikaans guys trying to learn English, you know, to get the tenses right. <laughs> but but the, one of the most important things that we ever need to get right is to understand that in the tenses of God's context, Jesus is the fullness of time. He, he is the manifestation of all the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1, um, from verse 18, we can perhaps if we have time, read that as well. But he says, in Afrikaans, he says, who feel beloved is that work mag wees. That means you can take your concordance and go and study every single promise with its condition. And all of that was concluded in Christ. Jesus is God's yes to the human race. So in understanding that, suddenly chapter 12, uh, chapter 13 makes sense. Let's read from verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes... Can you understand that? We know in part, we prophesy in part. 
But when the perfect comes, did he come or didn't he come? The perfect comes, the image of God, not proportionally, not, you know, 50% of God, and now we're waiting that in his second coming he's going to reveal the other 50%. 100% of God, the fullness of deity, dwells in Jesus Christ in bodily form. So here in this human body, now it makes it so much easier for us in our modern day technological context to understand that size can fool you. Today you can have a, a terabyte, a terrible bite, in, in a small, I mean, it's, it's like libraries of information can be reduced to a small little microchip. And so it's easier for us to understand that for so long, you know what Satan's biggest strategy was? Was to belittle you. Because suddenly, in Adam and Eve, Lucifer was confronted with the very image he worshipped for centuries, or forever, however long it took, before the fall, before his fall. And yet he encounters that same image, not the image of an angel, above an angel, in man, in human form. So if he can dwarf you through any context, make you feel, no man, you are just a mere man. You know, he's actually saying God made a mistake when he made you. It's a blemish on the character of God. Because God just in this process of trying to upgrade human lives that eventually at least the mothers would have four arms, you know, and whoever would do a few little extensions. And <laughs> Here he comes as the perfect image and likeness of the living God, the invisible God made visible. So the enemy wants to reduce us to, but we are grasshoppers and we think we've been doing the humble thing. Jesus says to Israel, in, uh, uh, God says to in, 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 in Jeremiah, in, in Isaiah 41, um, Wurmpe Jacob, little worm Jacob, you know, do not be afraid. He says, I want to give you new teeth, like a threshing sledge. I want you to eat mountains, meaning nations, instead of your daily bread, my little leaf, you know, gisaverim, to spin in a cocoon. That's, we'll be distracting a little bit. But let, let's just get back to 1 Corinthians um, 2. You see, Israel, 1 Corinthians 13, Israel did not die in the desert because of a lack of the supernatural there was enough manna enough quails enough healing enough supernatural i mean there was stuff there that would make any charismatic church <laughs> totally jealous israel in the desert but they died there because of one thing unbelief and you know what unbelief was directly reflecting they believed a lie about themselves because their leaders the majority of the leaders told them you're grasshoppers <laughs> you're no match for those giants so while I'm a grasshopper I'm just the mercy of God is wonderful you know just lap the wilderness and they're in the wilderness we are living with a sense of inferiority and we think we're giving glory to God and God's blessing me and keeping me alive Exactly. That's why the supernatural is not proof of faith. The supernatural is not proof of faith. They died because of unbelief. Exactly. It's an antivirus protection, you see. We might get into 2 Corinthians 10 if we, if we look at something to say just now. Remember 2 Corinthians 10. Because he speaks here that we have weapons that are not carnal, but they are mighty to pull down strongholds. And then the Greek says, we arrest every thought at spear point. That's the antivirus protection that works while you're sleeping. Because now the, the, your mind is so saturated in the understanding. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you in all wisdom and that's Colossians 3 16 in the context of Colossians 3 what is the word of Christ that you were raised together yes, with right. Christ yes. that now you've engaged your thoughts yes. that's letting the word dwell in you and that's not studying Deuteronomy 28 off by heart Deuteronomy 28 is outdated yes it's outdated you don't have to sit there and bless, oh, I'm the head and not the tail, I'm not this and that, and I avoid the curses. You know, someone asked me once, how do you guard your heart? Because I just heard a sermon that you've got to guard your heart by, by avoiding all the obstacles. I said, then you drive like a drunk man. Imagine a drunk guy, oops, oak tree coming up, going this way. No, no, you just, 
hit the rope. The, the rope's already avoiding the obstacles. So if we, we, we get so sim, we get so sim conscious, you know, that we're just, we're just and so devil conscious. We've got our feelings out for the devil all the time. We, and we sense this lust demon. We sense this, and we try, uh, trying to avoid. Uh, the antivirus protective mode means that you can turn this thing off and it's working. doesn't matter what kind of thing wants to hack your system. There is a, 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 a device designed stronger than the strongest hacker. And every weapon that is formed against you, every fiery dart is quenched. No temptation that you encounter is so unique that it's caught God off God. And God says, oh, oh we have to go and reinvent a new invention. You know, the, Paul says, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not something still to be invented. Nothing has what it takes to separate me because God engineered a union. Yeah. Listen, if God can engineer the, the, the galaxies in the universe and their precise position, their every delicate balance and orbits, how much more could that same God not express a perfect salvation? A perfect salvation. So if there is a perfect salvation, then the enemy's number one strategy would be to reduce my understanding of that salvation. So that my experience becomes my experience teacher. Let experience teach. No, no, no. That's a different kind of wisdom and it's devilish, James says. But there's a wisdom that comes from above. Because God's wisdom is not interrupted by human experience. God's wisdom is not interrupted by contradiction. God says, Paul says, Romans 3 verse 3, he says, what if some are unfaithful? Would their unfaithfulness not nullify the faithfulness of God? And then Paul says, what if all are faithful? The yellow means don't follow the birth site. So God remains faithful. So there's, uh, there's an integrity in, in what God accomplished in Christ. That is beyond question. While we witnessed the World Cup, I'm sure you did too, there were many dubious decisions. Many wishy-washy and flat stupid decisions by referees and by rules. I mean, here's the handball in the goals. And there's our only hope in Africa. Gone. <laughs> Gone out of it. I want you to understand that your redemption is beyond dispute. Your redemption, because it's from faith to faith. And he is the author of faith. I'm not talking about wishy-washy baloney faith. You know, you believe this, I believe this, and my grandma taught me this, and then I had this experience. I'm talking the faith of God. What God believes cannot be tampered with, not in all eternity. And God desires to persuade us more convincingly of what he's persuaded of. God is fully persuaded about you. 1 John 5, 9 says, we've received the testimony of man, but the testimony of God is greater. Why would God's testimony beat man's testimony? Because God's reference is Christ. Tetelestai. You see, God did not enter into a fragile Sabbath rest in Genesis 1 and 2. His rest was not determined by how Adam and Eve will perform. His rest was determined by lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. God's rest was not interrupted by Adam's fall. He knows the end from the beginning. And he swore by himself, not to convince himself, to convince us. That all the earth shall be flooded with light. The knowledge of the glory of the God. He says, all flesh shall see it together. Even as the waters cover the sea. I just want to just, for the sake of our reference in 1 Corinthians 13, distract myself back to this verse again. <laughs> <laughs> we were still talking about the tenses. The tenses, we exactly, the tenses. exactly. It's very important, it's a very important question, this, because this, you know, for so long we've said, oh, but now we're still just in mirror mode. I preach the mirror all the time. Our ministry is called the mirror message or mirror word. I remember when I, um, I'm going to interrupt myself again, but it just confirms this. I visited my brother Leon in the Ukraine. That was the time when Don and I made, remember Don, you were going back to the Ukraine just the next day or something after we saw you. And this is the first time that I've been away from Lydia for such a long time. And um, at that time, when was that, 2005, 2006, a couple of years ago, um, maybe five, six years ago, yeah. 
And um, it was very expensive to, to call from, from the Ukraine. So I just texted Lydia. I would just SMS her. And, I mean, the first day in Kiev, bought a little SIM card, slipped into my phone. And it was just the most amazing technological moment, you know, to realize that here I speak in a Russian dominant speaking language, a country. You don't understand any of the billboards. It's all like upside down letters. And, and here I'm going little Afrikaans text to my wife. And for a moment I thought, Yo, how long is this going to take? You know, imagine the millions of conversations going on, you know, in in Wi-Fi mode right now. And um, realizing how we can just trust technology. And sure enough, a few, maybe a minute or two later, the message comes back from her. And I was just overwhelmed that here we can text one another thousands of kilometers of distance, cancelled. And so we were texting daily. It was wonderful. We couldn't call, unfortunately. But when we arrived here in, in Haywards Heath with Andre um, and Mary Ann Rabe, First thing Andre did, he handed me his phone, and they could t- put in some kind of code that makes you talk for a penny for yeah. a long time. So I immediately called Lydia from his kitchen, just standing there. And it was just so amazing. When I heard a voice, I saw a face. Have you noticed that? When you hear someone's voice, you haven't heard from, you can just see that face. And both of us couldn't talk. We just stood there crying. And it was just such a moment that, yes, suddenly we've like, from text to voice mode. Hey. And it was just so awesome. You know, and immediately I thought of that beautiful scripture in Song of Songs, chapter 2. Oh, my dove in the cleft of the rock, let me hear your voice. Let me see your face. For your voice is sweet and your face is comely. And I know God wants to take us beyond text. I love the text. I'm addicted to the text. But if the text doesn't lead me into a, a face encounter, a face-to-face encounter, it just remains a wonderful prophetic word. But let's just read on. He says... Verse 9, for now we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes. Do you see, the perfect gives context to every fragment. Hebrews 1, verse 1, in many fragments, God has spoken to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, God has found the word. It's like a, 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 a poet finding a poem, a word that says it all. And in this inspired word, God communicates and communicated the word that was from the beginning, but in human form. Nothing of God was lost in human form. The fullness of deity that cannot be expressed in the expanse of the universe, expressed in the person of Christ. You see, the only Bible code you need to bother about is one called the Incarnation Code. The best translation you can study is the incarnation. It's realizing that the word is made flesh and a living epistle speaks so that all men may hear and read a language that includes them, that embraces them. So when the perfect comes, this is our reference. He came. The partial will be done away with. When I was a child, when was I a child in Paul's context? Nepios, under the law. If we that time going to Galatians chapter 3, yeah. um, it's, it's very powerful there. Under the law, my mind was reduced to the mind of a child. I spoke clumsily, prophetically. It was just like a little mirror image, very dim. Remember those mirrors, the brazen um, laver, is that what I pronounce it? <coughs> Where the priests had to wash themselves. It was made with mirror metal, but it was like polished bronze. Very interesting that, um, who's the guy who invented the printing press? In, 15, in the 1500s? G- yeah, Guten, Gutenberg. He was a mirror salesman. He sold mirrors, metal mirrors. And he used that same metal from the mirror to make the first printing press. That would mirror the language in print. Okay. <clears throat> For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak, I used to speak like a child. But when I became a man... When did we become a man? Today, I have begotten you, says Psalm 2. And Paul uses that text in Acts 13, preaching the resurrection. Jesus says in John 2, he says, destroy this temple, verse 19. Dangerous thing to say in John 2. I mean, you've still got to write the rest of John. You know what I mean? You can die for a public statement like that. You know? Destroy this temple! The disciples said, Jesus, but you can't talk like that. I mean, you know what this temple represents. 
<laughs> Don't touch the temple. You can't even take a photograph. They're going to lock you up. <clears throat> Later on, he gave more expressions. He says, not one stone will remain upon the other. The structure would remain an inferior expression of the tabernacle of God because it does not dwell in buildings made by human hands. Here is temple. So what does Jesus say? What temple was he talking about? Destroy it, and in three days, I will raise it up. What did Jesus raise up in three days? His body? Our bodies. We were raised. Remember, the only scripture in the whole Old Testament that speaks about the third day resurrection includes us. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. Hosea 6 verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. You see, if the enemy holds the veil in place, then we can just celebrate an historic Christ. He's got no problems with that. The devil doesn't even have a problem with you celebrating a futuristic Christ. You can preach the second coming until, you know, the next generation continues to preach. You can, I'm going to Rostov right now in a few days. My, my brother was preaching there a while ago, and, and he had all the city pastors together. And he asked them, how many people do you represent from the city of Rostov? And they made a calculation. They said, not even 1%. He said, you guys are preaching the second coming, the rapture. He says, I dare you. They've never heard of the first coming. He says, remember, 99 sheep in the fold, 1% out, one sheep lost. He goes and goes for that sheep. And yet we've got maybe one, maybe half of one, 99 out there. You see, if we don't understand the resurrection, then it remains historic. Where was he raised? In you. Peter says, we were born in you. When he was raised from the dead. When Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, while we were still dead in our trespasses and sins, long before we believed it, we didn't even know about it, he made us alive together with Christ. He raised us together with Christ. He seated us. So we ascended. We co-ascended. So that we can be co-revealed. Co-revealed is Colossians 3 verse 4. It's not when Jesus one day will appear, then we will appear with him in glory. Nonsense. Then my life is hidden with Christ in God. But if it's a hidden mystery, who's going to benefit from it but you? As for no more, near comes the rapture. Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you commission them in this world. Paul says, the love of Christ constrains me. He says, maybe it's much better out there, but I'm here for you. Yeah. I sometimes sit in funny places because large bodies travel difficult. And in Zimbabwe, you go into situations where you... Sometimes on the back of a truck, and I sit there with my little laptop, and the oak next to me sits there, and he checks out. And I show him some pictures of my wife and my children, my home. He says, why are you doing this? That's for you. So if you understand the love of Christ, then we realize that mankind is the property of God. We don't need any further convincing. Jesus convinced the human verse that God has an investment in this property. He went and he sold all that he had, and he bought the field, because there's a treasure in the field. And immediately you can no longer judge the field by face value. It's no longer my vineyard that matters. It's no longer my daily bread that matters. Give me the nations. Because we've discovered the value of the field. So he's revealed the field. So we knew in part when I was a child. But when I became a man. When did I become a man in God's economy? When Jesus was raised. 33 year old man. We were raised together with him. Raised together with him. But we grow in the knowledge of the image and the likeness of God in Him. Uh, when I was a child, you said, reason like a child, now I put away childish things. For now, and again now, now is the childish age under the law, the shadow. I see in a mirror dimly, but then becoming a man in the understanding of the truth. I mean, this eagle. Didn't have to wait and think, yeah, you know, I'm going to just try this out for three laps. And whoosh, the three laps with the other eagle, and then okay, I'll just go back to the cage now. It's going to sit there. A friend of mine uh, last year said to me, you know, he enjoyed that eagle message. He really loved it. He says, but I've got a problem. Every now and again, I find myself back in the cage again. He goes through, he's like, wow, you know. You know, mounting up with wings like an eagle was not for our entertainment, although it can be most entertaining. But it's the mode of our design. We are designed for heavenly places. Set your mind, Paul says, engage your thought 
with a different reality. You see, I cannot look at the things that are down here and look at the things that are up there at the same time. Double-mindedness gets me absolutely nowhere. It's just persuasion. It's a persuasion, you know. When Paul, when James speaks about it, he says, both the two believers can listen to the same message. I'll just read it to you. Um, those of you who are interested in the mirror translation on Esort, we can give you the link to that. Um, but this is lovely. James chapter 1, because James speaks here of both of two believers. Remember what they are hearing. They hear the word. What word? Verse 18 says, He brought us forth. By the word of truth. But he says, now, if any man hears this word and just remains a spectator, he's like a man who sees the face of his birth as in a mirror. There's not enough in what he saw that persuades him enough to participate in this freedom. So what he does? He for immediately forgets what manner of man he is. And he goes back to the old ugly duckling mindset. And he slots back into the old, old mindset. And he has perhaps very valid reasons because the context of James 1 is meeting various kinds of contradictions and temptations. And I mean, I've got many valid reasons to lose it, to feel incredibly sorry for myself or, or angry or whatever. Paul says, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Because if I give voice to my anger and immediately, the enemy, zzz, that's his landing strip. Remember when he says in Ephesians 4, give the devil no ground? He says... He immediately speaks about anger. He says, don't let the sun go down on you. So sometimes we translate that to think, okay, if I want to get mileage out of anger, get angry early. Because by sunset tonight, I'm going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it doesn't say that at all. It says the sun sets for you. The sun sets for you the moment you go into anger mode. And you know what he does? It gives the devil ground. He just said, give the devil no topos. It means a platform. He's an actor. He loves to act. He loves to draw the attention. And your anger, ignited, gives the devil a platform. And then he abuses you. It's like a virus. And you know, virus, virus just shows up. You don't have to go to coughing school. <coughs> Practice your cough. No, it just coughs. You know? So uh, it's amazing that, 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 that James says, quick to hear, slow to speak. And the quick, the quick to hear is, 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 the, is the key. It's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a settling. Because now he says, you gaze as deeply deeply into the law of perfect liberty and the greek word meton um, parakupto it's like this, this, this it's like almost like microscopic yeah. visual you know it's but they weren't any microscopes in, and it says parameno it is to to engage continually that word para is also a beautiful word we'll get into that a bit later but it's an engaging in that kavar mode Remember, the mirror is the kavar mode from Isaiah 40. So I'm intertwining with God's thoughts, or I'm intertwining with my disasters, and I'm intertwining with my problems, I'm having pity parties. We find fellowship in you know, common ground that we have. We've been abused, or we've been this, or we've been that, and so we, we have our little meeting, and our meeting engages us in this whirlpool of negativity. And we go away feeling sorry for ourselves even more. And you've heard my story now. You've got a better story. Now start feeling sorry for you. So we're all feeling very sorry. But it doesn't help. I mean, the, the other eagle didn't go and sit down with this eagle and said, tell me your story. How long have you been in the cage? How did they treat you there? I mean, he could have written a couple of <laughs> chapters and, and some soapies. But the truth was, this eagle was just flying. He wasn't even concentrating on the other eagle. Yeah. Yeah. You see, the ministry becomes so unconscious when you live conscious of who you are. Because you've engaged your thought. I no longer, I cannot, while you, I mean, here's this man raised together with Christ, but his mind snared with the flesh. And every symptom will be consistent. A virus is not a respecter of persons. You can be Christian, Catholic, Buddhist, no respecter of persons. But with my thoughts engaged with him, and it's the life of my design. It's not a difficult exercise. You know, we used to go read your Bible, pray every day and into these modes. And, and, and I've got to read it with discipline. And it's not that at all. Yeah. I remember when, when Lydia started writing to me, I immediately started communicating. I went back to Walfish Bay. She remained behind in Margate. 
I struggled with letters and, and, and opstellen. What's an opstellen? Essays at school. I had to talk to my older brother. He was brilliant with essays. And um, for, for a clean bribe, then he could help me with my essays. And my, my cousin was older than I am. He did very good with his, with his German, so he helped me with a few German essays. But when I fell in love, I didn't need my cousin or my brother to inspire my letters. I would start writing, and I would write, and at the back page you write, and before you post this letter off, you read it again and again and again. And when I get the letter back, I don't wait for a convenient time to read it. You know, okay, oh, another one from Lydia. I'm very busy today. I reckon, like, maybe day after tomorrow, I'll quickly, briefly have a look, glance. You tear it open, and you start reading, and you hear that voice, you see that face. There's an encounter, and it, it's addictive. Love is addictive because we're designed to love and to be loved. 100%. 24 hours, 7. I'm a car. We're designed for that. If we have less than that, then the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, says Jesus, to give you life more abundantly. So I'm not measuring myself anymore by the size of the contradiction or the voices that come against me or the symptoms that try and show up. But there's a greater voice of greater authority. And that voice resonates in me. I'm addicted to the voice of the Spirit. I'm addicted to not some spooky encounter, but the reality of my nearness. I mean, I'm in Emmanuel's embrace. This is what he initiated. All this is from God. And he reconciled us. He cancelled distance. Can I quickly read you? Eh? Let, I just want to quickly read you this translation in James 1. <laughs> the difference between a mere... James 1.22 By being a mere spectator <laughs> By being a mere spectator in the audience You underestimate yourself I want you to hear this sure. You know what reduces you to audience mode? By looking at the skill Of the operator Whether it's football, whether it's preaching Whether it's Formula 1 yeah, Wow And the masses are reduced to audience Even in ministry if my message or my ministry was here to impress you with me, I would be a total failure. You will be totally disappointed. But it's here to impress you with you. As parents, we're not there to impress our children with our parenthood, but with how they are, who they are. Because that's what Jesus came to unveil. So James says in verse 22, by being a mere spectator in the audience, you underestimate yourself. Remember what is happening here. He says, the one who forgets, he says, for he sees himself. You know that if you hear gospel preaching and you don't see yourself, you're not hearing the gospel. You're not hearing the mystery. In Africa, we often preach in areas where people don't often see bleak white faces. And some of the kids would run away from this white ghost. <laughs> they run. But now I learned, you know, so I've got a little digital camera. So I'd quickly snap a shot, you know, I'll, I'll call and they look around, and they've never ever seen their faces in a picture. So they mesmerize, they turn around and overcome their fear because they recognize their own face in the picture. And they'd run and recognize, remember. And they go call their friends and I quickly grab a few more shots. And then it's absolute chaos because they all want to touch this thing. And I've got to hold it up here and they, they're pointing at you are so there, you know. And tell them this is the gospel. You are in God's picture. Otherwise, it's just Moses and Daniel and our boring. How many times do you have to hear that story before it really gets, eh? yeah. scoop it up with a bit of, you know, and how? The gospel is the unveiling, flannel. <laughs> it's the unveiling of who you are. So James says, yeah, you are hearing the word of truth about who you are. When Jesus says, remember, when you continue in my word, I'm not talking about the red letter edition. I'm talking about the language of God. What did God say to mankind in Jesus? As Paul saw it by revelation. Christ in you. He says, you will know the truth. About, about what? About who you are. Because you're going to be free. He doesn't need to be set free. Jesus doesn't need healing. Doesn't need deliverance from depression. He's cool. He wants us. He wants us to be what God has designed us to be. The vehicles, the voice of his deliverance. Of his freedom. Of his attraction. There's nothing more attractive than the, than the Christ life revealed. Nothing can do you better than just understanding. He dwells in me. He tabernacles in me. No facelift can match that. <laughs> Some lady said to me the other day that my wife saved them a lot of money because they had appointments at some facelift situation and operations. 
but they realized that they were looking at the wrong mirror. You see, this mirror becomes a voice, no longer seen dimly, but face to face. I remember landing in, in um, Cape Town that time, and I realized I no longer need my mobile phone to text or talk. What do I say? <laughs> Hallelujah. We are designed for God's embrace. And our religion robbed us for years to just do our little quiet times and things just don't get quiet enough so they can just, if we can just get one little bit of inspiration somewhere. <laughs> the whole book's about him and all of him is about you. We said yesterday that faith has got absolutely nothing to do with your ability to concentrate on God. But it has everything to do with your realizing that God is mindful of you. I challenge you, wake up in the morning with your first thought. I am his darling. I'm his beloved. He's mindful of me. And what attracted him to me while I was yet a sinner was what he knew about me. Because in that same, my favorite verse I didn't even touch on, in that same 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Then we will know fully even as we have always been known. Isn't that amazing? I put on my little card. I haven't got enough of them. I've just got a couple. just wrote there to know as we have always been known. I mean, to me, it overwhelms me daily. I don't have to try and introduce myself to God. Hey, Jesus, this is me. <laughs> he knows my thoughts are far off. He knows my sitting down, my rising up. Nothing can overwhelm mankind more than the knowledge that their maker knows them. You can never again just dwindle into some statistic, some vague statistic. God is passionately in love with the individual. He didn't come to Christ clone us into little robots. He came to give expression to the highest order of life, the Christ life in ordinary people that's what he communicates that's why paul says with unveiled faces we're beholding we have the same reference and in that reference we are changed into his likeness Do you see the likeness of god is the theme of scripture that's what jesus came to redeem the likeness of our maker redeemed in flesh in human form so that God can find an expression larger than the most spectacular sunrise, sunset, nature moment, DSTV moments. He's come to find expression in you. No wonder we are epistles known and read by all men. And God says the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall flood the earth as the waters cover the sea. And where will the water come from? Out of your innermost being. Do you see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? We've confused with an inpouring. It's out of your innermost being. The enemy wants to wedge in little distances. And he uses all kinds of scriptures to make you think, okay, I'm not quite there yet. Because as long as he can sell me that I'm not quite there yet mode, I have a valid excuse to remain, to remain unfruitful. The devil doesn't have a big problem with people going to heaven. His biggest problem is keeping people, believers, neutralized on planet earth. And he sells to us that our point of departure is actually our goal. So we're striving towards heavenly places. But that's where you start. We are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Not, it's not a progressive thing. It's not we're getting there eventually. That's where we find ourselves, where he found us in Christ. Pin code of the Bible, those two words, in Christ. John says 1 John 5, 20. We know that the Son of God has come. And He's given us what? Understanding. And what's the understanding all about? To know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. It's powerful.